what did the Prophet wasallam say? If you will put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, which is the two lights of the whole world, never will I give up the mandate Allah has put upon me. The Queen of England has now passed away. Her health rapidly deteriorated and within a few hours she was announced dead. Death came to her unexpected, uninvited and unplanned. Now straight away I remembered the verse in the Quran where Allah says That wherever you may be, death will overcome you even if you are in fortified towers. Meaning you can try and do whatever you like to save yourself from dying but the reality is that no amount of money, no amount of power and no amount of trying will ever save you. The cold reality is that you will eventually die. As Allah promises in the Quran, Kullu nafsin maut. Every single soul will taste death. Now what's really interesting is that when Allah makes this promise that we'll all die, He then defines what true success is straight after as if they're both linked. فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةِ فَقَدْ فَازِ Whoever avoids entering the hellfire and enters paradise will have truly succeeded. This is incredibly symbolic. Allah is reminding you that this life is temporary. And because it's temporary, success does not lie here. It lies in the hereafter. In other words, you can hustle and you can bustle and you can strive and you can save money, you can get power, but ultimately it doesn't matter. Why? Because your destination is one and success is also one. Now, how is it that we achieve ultimate success? The answer is very simple, by being a Muslim, i.e. someone who submits to the guidance of their creator and not the guidance of creation. As Allah says, And whoever wishes any other way other than Islam, it will never be accepted from them and they will be of the losers in the hereafter. Since me and you cannot guarantee that we'll see tomorrow, it's time that we turn to Allah before we return to Allah. A lot of goodness awaits you. Just keep trying. You're a human. Allah knows you're a human being. Allah knows the pressures and the stresses you're going through. Allah knows the environment you're living in. Allah knows the circumstances you're facing more than anyone else. Allah knows the challenges that you have. Allah knows that you're trying to make ends meet. Allah knows everything. Allah knows that you're faltering from time to time. He knows that you're dropping back into the same sin again and again. Each time you regret and say, Oh Allah, I'm weak. I'm a human. Forgive me, Oh Allah. I'm not doing this out of defiance of you. You are my maker. I have none other than you to forgive me, to have mercy on me, to carry me into the hereafter. But it's my human weakness that makes me fall into this. When you try your best five times a day, I'm trying. Sometimes people are weak four times, three times, and others will tell them you're no longer a Muslim. Hang on, ignore those people. But sometimes the approach is hard and harsh. It may drift you further away. You need to know, even if you have not been praying, the day you start is the day you shall succeed. Have you not heard he's the most merciful, the most kind, the most compassionate, the most forgiving, the most amazing? That's my Lord. If he made me, surely he is amazing. I can't wait to meet him. And when I do, I'm convinced he's not just going to throw me aside and punish me and so on. I tried to be a decent person in, in this world. I tried to do good things. I tried. T-R-Y. That's the secret. Why would we even despair of Allah? You know, very often the only reason why we despair is because we think that Allah is like we think He is. But we have to look at Allah the way that He told us He is. Say, O my servants that drown. Can you imagine? My servants that drown in sin, that transgressed against themselves in sin. Meaning they're like literally sinning, sinning, sinning. How is He calling them? O sinners? O you losers, oh you weak creation, ibadi, my servants, so that everybody would know as long as you believe in him, Jalla wa ala, there is a chance for you to be saved. So this is why when he says, They say the only one who despairs of Allah is the one who despairs of himself. 
Beware of using your heart for other than what it was created for. Your heart was created to do big things. Your heart was designed to glorify Allah. And if you do something with your heart other than what it is compatible with, it will ache and it will start to throb and you will be scared, you will be down. Your heart was not designed for those DMs, those private conversations, to sell drugs, to miss salah, to mess about with your hijab. Your heart was not designed for that. Your heart was designed to be close to Allah, to glorify Him. And when you don't do that, you will feel pain according to the size and the length of time that you've been engaged in that crime. They'll say to themselves, since I am not the best believer, what's the point anyway? And they'll give up on all their practices, prayer altogether, practice altogether, because I'm not perfect. And the rationale they will argue is amazing. Look, I'm not perfect, okay? I can't do all that stuff. You may never be the best, but you can certainly become better. There will never be a day in my life where I'll say, finally, I'm the best that I can be. But I could be able to say, I'm doing better. It's actually a mercy of Allah that Allah did not expect perfection. Allah expected improvement. Some people improve slowly, some people improve quickly. Some people are willing to give everything they own for the sake of Allah, and some people can give a percent of what they own, and that's, that's improvement from zero. Allah has promised the most beautiful things to all of them. You and I have to prioritize what good thing can I do that is of maximum benefit to me and the people around me that I can present before Allah because I have limited time. One thing that many of our youngsters living in today's day and age, the problem that they have is that they want to mix with the opposite gender. This is again something that comes within our desires. You have many youngsters who cannot control their gaze and they surrender themselves to their lusts and desires. And remember, lusts and desires is something that surrounds Jahannam. And I want to refer back to the opening hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He surrounded Jahannam with all sorts of things and this was one of them. The lusts and desires, not lowering your gaze. When brothers want to look good and they want to drive around looking for the opposite gender. And similarly, we have sisters who are dressing up, trying to attract the opposite gender as well. Guys driving around in cars with music blaring. This is a sign that these people are following their desires. And based on the narration at the beginning, this is a path that will lead us to the fire of hell. If you're finding it difficult to lower your gaze today and you're following your desires, start to fast. Because as your body weakens, you will not want to look at the opposite gender. Things like this will not appeal to you. Today on social media, it's publicized in an indirect way. How? The way girls and boys pose on the internet to other people. That type of posing is a sexual posing, my brothers and sisters in Islam. The way they do it with their mouth and with their eyes and with their faces. Rasulullah told us they publicize zina. You know that round mouth thing? What do they call it? Duck face. This thing was taken from the baboon kingdom. Did you know that? You study zoology, I'll tell you, it's from the baboon kingdom. Because the baboon have a big red side. And I'm not saying that, you know, it's lipstick or degrading anybody. No, 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 no. I'm saying they display it in order to call the mate. Now we're displaying it, boys and girls. I'm not talking about females only. I'm talking about men as well. I'm not being sexist here. I'm saying the publicizing of sexual material and sexual images. Sorry if I said that word too many times. Because we live, and I'm going to say it one more time, in a hypersexualized society. Rasulullah told us this is what's going to happen, and this is the most widespread thing right now. Most widespread thing right now. People are going to die with this. It is an absolute epidemic that Rasulullah told us. Wafasha zina. Zina is widespread throughout. He's not talking about the non Muslims. He is telling the Ummah, he's saying, My Ummah, they will be in that. And then, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Then, Mark my words, he said, then mark my words, terminal illnesses, diseases and pain that had never existed in their ancestors before them will come become widespread among them. And this is the types of this called Ta'un. Ta'un in those days was any unknown sickness that brought death to a person. There was no cure to it. And he said there will be diseases that have no cure that will become an epidemic among my ummah. Today we have HIV. AIDS and we have STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. Now I have questions like this from the Muslim community. 
brother said I'm a marriage celebrant. So people come to asking me questions. Can I get married? I said, yes, why not? And these are the types of questions I'm getting now. Brother, do I have to tell this person that I'm getting married to that I have STD? Did you know that these are the questions they're asking me right now? All over the place. We say, yes, of course you have to tell them because it's a contagious disease. They say, what if I have it under control? There's some kind of control pills. Say, but when you, when you don't have the pills, they actually, what, they exacerbate. And then if they're pregnant, they have a child, the child gets that STD as well automatically. Did you know that? Among the Muslim Ummah. You know why? Because people, what they say is, that Muslims, they say, I'm not committing zina, but they do everything else. And look what happens. That's what Rasulullah told us. The second thing he said, they will cheat in their business and trade as a livelihood. And that's when drought will come upon them, meaning poverty, dictating rulers and oppressive rulers upon them. This is happening among the Ummah. They live upon cheating, lying and betraying. I'll give you an example. A Muslim wants to buy a car from another Muslim. One Muslim says, Wallahi, it cost me this much. The other Muslim believes him because he said, Wallahi. So then the other Muslim wants to blackmail him. How does he blackmail him? By using verses of the Quran and Hadith. Allah said, Rasulullah said, Love for your brother what you love for yourself. I'm your brother. Give me a cheaper price. So the other brother resorts to the Wallahi thing and he resorts to the Hadith thing. Each one blackmailing the other person with the religion. And this brings to me a Hadith of Rasulullah where he said, and people, this is in Ibn Majah, he said, People will use the religion for their worldly gain. This is towards the end of time. They will use the religion for their worldly gain. They will use the religion for a status. Look at me, I'm a shaykh. Now listen to me. I'm a shaykh, female. Now listen to me. I am uh, such and such of a person. This is my hadith and ayat. Now I will get to make people believe what I say and I'll be the person who everybody listens to. It's even worse today because we get to hide behind usernames on, com on the computer. Everybody, even the most shyest of people have be has become the loudest person now. Sits in their bedroom, hides behind the username and feels it okay to type anything. It never goes off. And this is where your fatwa now is People kind of believe some things when they get written. I don't know why. This is the world we live in, using the deen for worldly gain. Number three, he said, they will stop their zakat. People, how many people even know the rules in Islam of zakat? What are the rulings of zakat? How do you give zakat? For what do you give zakat? I'm sure, mashallah, a lot of us know a lot about Islamic finance and the riba banks. Because many Muslims, they say, What's this Islamic finance business? I'll just go to ANZ. It's the same thing, man. This is trade. This is it's just a different name, they say. If everybody's such an expert on Islamic finance and all this other finance, how come they don't know much about zakat? This is what Rasulullah is saying. People become ignorant about their own deen. Number four, he said, they will betray the promises and loyalty to Allah to the point that the enemy will control and possess their wealth. Now, millions and billions of dollars are given away to the non-Muslims to deal with it in our own countries and control us. The fifth thing is, their leaders and figures do not apply the laws of Allah's book, but choose what suits from them for themselves until Allah curses them with disunity and enmity amongst each other. I say to you, it's not just the leaders, but all figures. Everybody now has become a leader, a self-appointed leader of themselves on social media, for example. And what it has caused is disunity and defragmentation of our ummah. We cut each other off. We don't talk to each other. We meet each other now on Facebook and that's about it really. But if I were asked, why am I a Muslim? That's a very good question. Why am I a Muslim? I am a Muslim because I believe I was created by a maker. And I believe that maker is the only one who deserves any act of worship. I want to have a direct relationship with my maker. That's why I'm a Muslim. I don't want to go via a stick or a stone or a tree or a grave or another person. I want to go me and Allah, me and my maker who made me and made entire creation. That's why I'm a Muslim. Because Islam teaches submission to the maker alone. No one else. I go to Allah. Yes. I have learned what revelation has brought through the messengers. I respect and honor the messengers, all of them. That's why I'm a Muslim. I believe Allah Almighty, the maker, the creator of entire creation would never leave us, would never leave us without a message as to why he made us, as to what he wants from us. When Allah loves you, he becomes the hearing by which you hear, the sight by which you see, the hand by which you strike the foot by which you walk. What that means is 
you will get to a point where you only hear those things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Things that you used to listen to because they pleased you, you now actually dislike them because you know that they're displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is natural, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you in a way that looking at someone from the opposite gender that's attractive is pleasing to you. But because you know that it's not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you actually want to lower your gaze. You actually don't want to look because you know that it's not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You find an aversion to things that you naturally incline towards. Why? Because Allah is more precious to you than even yourself. And those who, who believe their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than anyone's love for anything else. That's a love that cannot be quantified.